All right. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. We are going to be talking about data science methodology, which is an awesome subject about an hour after lunch when everything's settling in, you're getting a little nappy and, and, and all of that stuff. So instead of talking about the really awesome thing I just did with deep learning or, or a random forest, I'm going to talk about how we do things with deep learning and random forest, if you will. Um, my perspective on this comes from working with this fantastic bunch of people at Silicon Valley Data Science. We are a consulting company who builds data science things for other companies, uh, which means that we work under a contract, <coughs> which among other things means that um, if, if I screw up a data science project, I don't just get fired, I can get sued. Uh, and I can risk the livelihood of all of these people. So uh, working under contract uh, puts me into a, a, a frame of mind where rigor isn't just a nice thing to have, it's actually a necessity for our business to be successful. Uh, but I will submit to you that the kind of rigor we use on our projects is broadly applicable to uh, data science teams that, that don't do this under contract that work inside of companies doing great things as well. And uh, a lot of the things I've learned and will present to you come from conversations I've had with folks who lead those kinds of teams. Uh, a member of this team is Dr. Jeffrey Yao, by the way, who is uh, on faculty here as well. So Jeffrey is uh, <coughs> deeply involved in the creation and execution of the, what we're going to talk about today. We, um, we have a philosophy or an approach to these things that <coughs> uh, Jeffrey and I were laughing as, as Charles gave the keynote this morning because we're so completely aligned in how we approach these things. Uh, I think he said design with the end in mind and we say the outcome in mind. Um, and we talk about prioritizing for business value because a lot of times we're working with new technologies to, uh, to, to help companies solve problems and the technologies are shiny, right? So. Um, if you, if you find yourself as a data scientist in an organization someday with, the, with the, the problem of deciding what project to work on, think about where the business needs help and how to impact it uh, fruitfully from the business's standpoint, not just, ooh, there's a really cool opportunity for me to apply technique X. Um, we do this in an agile fashion, and that's what I'm going to spend the bulk of, of, of this afternoon talking about. Um, I've had a couple of conversations at lunch about <clears throat> the nature of data science being a, what I call a nonlinear process, which is to say that uh, there, there are things that, you know, when you build a house, you build the foundation, and then you put some walls around it, and flooring, and things like that, and there's a certain incremental linear progress towards reaching that goal uh, that's fairly predictable and well understood, so you can say something like, hey, I'm 75% done building a house. Solving a data science problem often involves, and I'm guessing you all are intimately familiar with this, beating your head against the wall for a while, thinking about the problem, going, how am I going to do this? Uh, and then ult ultimately you go, aha, what if I treat this as an ordinal binning prediction rather than a continuous prediction? Maybe I can do something useful, and suddenly I've figured out how to predict the stock market. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you do that, by the way, I'd be curious to hear. hear. <coughs> um, I think an, another thing that, that is implicit in the method I'm about to describe is it emphasizes collaboration, not only within a team, but with the folks who, who you're trying to help solve a problem. And, and I think the way that Charles said this was that um, you, you want to understand the people and what they're doing that you seek to impact so that you uh, can build a system that's relevant. I built the most awesome mail sorting program in the world circa 2005. Uh, and it turns out that the way I built that <coughs> was absolutely unusable by the United States Postal Service because of the way they organize labor and run those machines. So great optimization solution that was absolutely worthless to them because of their business processes and organizations. Uh, so collaborating with the people you're trying to help helps you avoid those situations. That had a happy ending, by the way. R.R. Donnelly bought it, so <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> a, a quick word on... on doing data science, especially out in industry, you will, you will come across clients and, and folks who manage their data infrastructures who will say things like, well, before we get that data, we must clean it and validate it. You can't bring data into our organization willy-nilly, and my God, what are you trying to do? Anybody could get access to it, and we must protect it. These are valuable resources, all of which are very legitimate concerns, by the way. Uh, but Traditional data management processes focus on securing data and, and making it very difficult to access uh, and things like that. And one of the challenges is uh, orienting towards what we like to think about, which is what do you want to do with data, right? Data science 
<clears throat> projects and capabilities are fundamentally about trying to help somebody solve a problem better with data. And so it's things like, how do I attract new customers? How do I automate? How do I target my VIP customers, right? These are the kinds of uh, uh, impacts that, that we were hearing about this morning in business terms, rather than can I execute a query in, you know, in, in 200 milliseconds, or can I get a model that's 97.3% accurate? <laughs> <clears throat> and when we do these things, we're, we're essentially traversing a process that I, I like to, to talk about a value chain. You see lots of stack diagrams and technology talks and things like that. And, and if you think about what you're doing when you do a data science project, you're trying to solve some problem and ultimately you're exposing some capability to a decision maker, whether that's a, a little script on a call center operator screen that tells them what to cross sell, upsell to us. Uh, maybe it's a flashing light on a distribution control center for a power grid saying that transformer just is about to fail. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that you expose insight to an organization. It starts with finding the data that helps you understand the pattern that helps you do something useful. And it used to be that that was very easy and <clears throat> you had three sources, like you'd go to Axiom or a couple other places and say, hey, do you have data on my customers? Uh, but now there's like a thousand of these and half of them are across the bay over there in uh, Silicon Valley and San Francisco. <clears throat> and some of those aggregate and some of those aggregate the aggregators. And so how do you know and find uh, the data to solve your problem is actually a very <laughs> difficult problem that uh, I would encourage people looking for PhD ideas that that's a good one. And I was just talking to Joe Hellerstein about that earlier today. Then you gotta get that data in to a system that you can use to do something with it. And that often involves things like uh, processing, pre-processing, right? So sessionizing uh, uh, somebody's web activity or things like that. That you ultimately persist in some data architecture and integrate with some other parts of your worldview, right? So, um, so let's, let's talk mail, because it's nice and quaint, and I just started talking about it, right? So I get data from the sorting machines, I put them in a database, I integrate that with my truck fleet, and now I understand how sorted mail is moving from location to location and eventually getting delivered to an end address. To be able to predict that performance, then I need to put those data sets together and do some analysis, and then maybe I'm able to predict uh, on time or, or the likely delivery date of a piece of mail, given when it was input into the system, and ultimately expose that to a business mailer <coughs> uh, who's just sent you your bill so that when uh, you don't pay your bill and you, they call you up and you say, oh, my check's in the mail, well, that was a business reply envelope that had a special thing on it, and the call center guy goes, no, no, well, no, it's not, I'd see it. Right? You're able to see that thing moving through the system. Um, any kind of data project is traversing this, right? And some projects uh, will focus in on, hey, maybe I need a better solution to integrate these two data sets. I don't have a common key and I'm trying to do fuzzy matching and taking an algorithmic approach to that. Or maybe I'm building an end-to-end -end system. But the kinds of projects I'm, gonna, I'm talking about today uh, ultimately involve doing these things. This is the meta method with, within which the method I'm going to talk about um, is, is applicable. And, and the thought I want to highlight here is that often there's an end-to-end -end solution you're trying to do, whether it's uh, improve the mail stream, <coughs> uh, predict problems with uh, diabetic patients. There's, you know, data can do all of these things. Often there's a very specific part of that problem which is poorly understood and the rest of it is well understood, right? Um, we don't need to conduct a proof of concept to prove that we can store data in a relational database. That's fairly well understood. However, we may not understand whether or not we can <coughs> understand people's behavior in a way that allows us to predict a next action and do something useful. So often the data science part of a problem that is a larger end-to-end -end engineering and data science solution is the poorly understood part of the problem. And before you go building some big grandiose system uh, to solve these, understanding what you don't understand and designing some kind of prototyping or proof of concept exercise to prove to yourself that you can do that hard part is where you should start. And then once you've demonstrated you can do that usefully, build the whole thing. <clears throat> so when we decide we're gonna do something, how do we, how do we organize around that? And there are uh, a few examples out there uh, of methods for data science. Uh, how many people have heard of CRISP-DM? That's part of the point. There, there's lots of them, but very few people actually know they exist or use them. Um, and they go, they go like this, right? Like, okay, I have a business understanding of a problem I need to 
have a data understanding of that problem so that I will prepare some data uh, and then I will build a model and then I'll evaluate the effectiveness of that model and if I have a model I feel confidently will we'll generalize, I'll, I'll go out and deploy that. And that is a great method for solving a, a data science problem when we don't think about what in the abstract. <coughs> but if um, in, the, in the world where basically most of the data science was to score a table in a database that would send you a physical letter in the mail saying, hey, come on to our store on Thursday. There's a special offer. Uh, this was OK. Nobody got killed. Nobody got hurt. And nobody went broke. In a world where you have real-time trading systems that, true story, can lose $450 million in a period of about 45 minutes, suddenly the lack of a test step is a big problem here. Um, which is to say that, that software engineering and data science are converging. And there's a set of methods from software engineering about making sure a system does what you think it's going to do that can inform us. But data science solutions are often stochastic systems. They're, they're, they're probabilistic. They're not <coughs> completely predictable. Uh, so how you test them and make sure they do what you think they do is, is a really important question. Uh, and, and if you didn't, if Knight Capital hadn't uh, accidentally elevated a model to production without testing it, uh, they'd probably still be in business today. But because they didn't, they aren't. So software engineering has been worried about this for a while. They got some methods that we could think about using. Um, some of my data scientists have an allergic reaction to anything that comes from the world of engineering. And I, I would submit to you that, that I will take a method from professional wrestling if it helps us do our jobs better and solve problems better. Um, you know, when you're building a large-scale enterprise uh, ERP system or customer relationship management system, well-understood problems, waterfall is a great way to do it. Um, if you're not familiar, don't worry about it because I'm not going to dwell on it today, but that is the process of excruciatingly detailed planning of each step in a process uh, before you even start. <coughs> Agile is uh, software engineering. There's, it's got a capital A there. I'm going to be talking about Agile with a small a to avoid religious arguments. But, <laughs> but Agile is a method designed to help you solve problems for which you don't, can't anticipate the process you will go through. It will be iterative. You may hit roadblocks. You may need to steer around it. Safe is, what is safe? Safe is something Agile for the enterprise. Scalable Agile for the enterprise. Um, Scrumfall is another version of an attempt to marry Waterfall and Agile, and I affectionately call those the mullet of methodologies. <laughs> it's party in front, or party in the rear, business up front, and actually doesn't look that good in either case. <laughs> so because I have the pressure of trying to do these things predictably and reliably for our clients, and, and because they get really mad at me when I fail, I had a very uh, a compelling interest in developing a method that, that was allowed us to manage and execute data science for companies in a way that embraced the uncertainty inherent to the exercise, uh, but uh, gave us some, some useful ways of communicating progress and progressing to a goal. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> so one of the core things about data science is, like I said, it's, it's one of those nonlinear processes. And um, if, if our goal is to start where that red dot is and finally make our way to this lovely little park over here, uh, there's a fairly straightforward way to get there with a couple of turns that we might anticipate is how we will go there. But if it turns out that there's a huge accident <coughs> right here or something, then we maybe don't want to go with the original path we intended. Maybe we want to route around it. And the idea behind uh, an agile process is that you are always getting new information about your solution. And if you are not wedded to a long-term plan with discrete steps, you are in a position to uh, embrace the uncertainty and the learnings along the way and change tact based on new information, like a, uh, a problem in the traffic here. <clears throat> or a problem in the way you thought you were going to onboard and, and, and build a pipeline to ingest data from a mobile app there. <clears throat> also, back to this morning's keynote, um, we define our success in these things not in the terms of can I query that in, in 200 milliseconds, but can I drive incremental revenue? Can I, can I get something to market faster? Um, one of my favorites, economically functional implementations. I, I built a, a system for a company that originally built something on Oracle, which scales up. Um, 
and has diseconomies of scale, and <clears throat> which means that as they got successful, the cost to serve each of their customers went up and up and up, and their price didn't. Uh, so you can see the problem coming in this business model. Eventually, the victim of their own success, they would actually be giving all of their money to Larry Ellison and, and Oracle in this case. And I'm a fan of our America's Cup pursuit, but it seems like we have that in hand. So rather than, rather than go out of business giving money to Oracle, they built a system on commodity hardware that scales horizontally, uh, that, that maintains the uh, benefits of their product. So scaling characteristics can be the, the, the terms of success of, of a project. Good old cost avoidance is another one. Um, people also uh, do, do, do data science and engineering projects for things like brand benefits. I, I, I joke, you, you, have you guys heard the commercial of Udacity of you know, learn tech from, from, the, from online from uh, people who worked at Google and Facebook based on a platform built on Hadoop? It's like, why do I care that my learning platform is built on Hadoop? <laughs> by people from Google and Facebook. Actually, they're, they're advertising to you as future employees, saying, by the way, if you want to work on the cool stuff, come work with us. So there's all kinds of reasons that you might be using the technology you're using or solving the problems you're solving. Uh, but they should be business reasons, uh, or you should understand the business reasons so that you make an appropriate solution and don't build the world's greatest sortation algorithm for a, a system that can't use it. So the question becomes, how do we get there? <coughs> and I'm going to go through an example project and sort of lay out the way we do this uh, pretty quickly because it's not that complicated, but hopefully this gives you some ideas as you go out and work on your own projects on how to formulate and execute uh, and evaluate a hypothesis and, and how to ultimately solve a business problem. And then that usually starts with a charter, a big grained thing. Um, I, want to, I want to see if I can... Uh, identify cancerous tumors and x-rays might be a good charter. Let's see how far I can go with analytics example here. So an investigation theme might be, uh, I, I want to see if I can use deep learning on x-rays of lungs to identify lung cancer tumors. And an epic might be, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to identify uh, non-normal objects in an x-ray. And a story, the most specific level might be, I'm going to use deep learning on this particular set of uh, examples to see if I can train an outlier detection algorithm on an, ex on an image. Which is to say that we start with this big thing we want to do. We decompose that into themes of hypotheses we want to evaluate, the things we don't understand well. We then chunk those up into manageable groups of work which answer sub-questions that are, are useful and then ultimately those turn into stories that a person or a couple of people can execute in a reasonably short period of time uh, so that we can understand the answer to a sub-question. <coughs> so, I will do a little example project that uh, we have worked on. Our office is in Mountain View overlooking the train station and before that we were in Sunnyvale over overlooking the train station. Uh, and the train goes by and makes lots of noise and you're on the phone with your customer and you're like, hold please, because this thing is so loud, nobody's gonna hear me. We decided to make some lemonade out of our proximity to the Caltrain and also due to the fact that uh, a lot of us work uh, or take the Caltrain to work and it's very unpredictable, we thought, hey, why not take advantage of the fact that we're looking at this thing? Uh, I'm a, I have a recording studio at home. Let's put a microphone out on the balcony, learn to detect when the train goes by, see if we can then understand how the Caltrain's running versus schedule and tell us so that we know when we're gonna be late to work because of the Caltrain. <coughs> so, can I build a data science driven capability to understand the current operating conditions of Caltrain based on passively observed data because while well, I'm sh perfectly sure that there are nice GPS sensors on top of all those trains, they don't seem to use them. <coughs> if you're not familiar, over on this side of the bay, Caltrain goes on the other side of the bay in one nice long line here. It's about 30 years old. There's about 52,000 people on it. Um, they claim their on-time performance is 92%. I have no idea how they calculate that number because near as I can tell, they have no idea if they're on time or not. <laughs> and the API that theoretically tells you this had a three-month outage back in uh, 2014 <laughs> when we started on this. So even if they did do it, it's kind of unreliable and we wanted an independent source of truth. <coughs> so. One thing I'm fond of saying is Agile does not mean a, a lack of intent, right? I want to build something that usefully understands the status of, of Caltrain and, and provides that to riders. Um, and I have a general notion of how this is going to play out. 
like I said, we had some microphones lying around, so we started doing audio signal detection to try and figure out <coughs> if we could tell when a train went by. Uh, as a side note, my favorite uh, false positive on this was, it turns out uh, the train honks its horn before any intersection, so that's the most distinctive part of the train. Also turns out that if the Google or the Apple bus pull into the municipal bus stop and the municipal bus pulls up behind them, the municipal bus driver gets very upset and starts laying on his horn. <laughs> that sounds a lot like the train's horn, so we had to learn to distinguish between pissed off municipal bus driver horn and <laughs> Caltrain engineer horn. And we thought, hey, you know, the balcony can see too, let's put a video camera out there and see if we can tell direction. Uh, gives us another signal to work with to better disambiguate uh, when it's a train and when it's a bus. Ultimately, then we'll want to build some event classifier to go from these independent signals to, hey, that was train 227 North Brown Express, and it just went by. And also, incorporate some other signals. So it turns out when the train's running late, the people tweet. Uh, and, and if the train is in the state I call FUBAR, which happens with surprising frequency and sad consequences, um, that you, you can tell that too, and, and in that case, we haven't done this yet, but we're just gonna turn, our app's gonna turn into an Uber button, basically. <laughs> <coughs> like, running single track, all local, and it's going to be that way for a while. The best thing we can do for you is help you find an alternate route. <coughs> <coughs> but if we can't do that audio and video signal detection and build an event classifier, then building an app that surfaces that to an application isn't terribly useful, right? So, so we front load the parts we don't understand and then as we get confidence in our ability, we start building the things around it that actually turn that thing into a usable uh, system. And in this case, you know, we started bringing in the Caltrain API, which actually we use in a kludgy way to understand when a train arrives. They don't tell you when a train arrives, they tell you the predicted time when a train will arrive and then they stop talking about that train and so they update it every minute and presumably if it went, you know, train 221 is in three minutes and then two minutes and then one minute and then it's gone, it arrived somewhere between that last one and observing it's gone. So that's how we get our notion of when trains arrive throughout the network to build a model that says if it's five minutes late in Sunnyvale, it'll be 12 minutes late in Millbrae. You gotta build a processing pipeline, especially when you're playing with Twitter. The, 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 the tweets are numerous, uh, even though we're fairly strongly filtering them, to ultimately make that into a prediction service that says, okay, when is the train coming for, to the stop I care about because I need to get on it and go there? And then we'll test it. Fortunately, we put a big disclaimer. This is a free app. You can download it from the Apple Store. Um, you get what you pay for. We, if, if you miss your train because our prediction was wrong, thank you for participating in our experiment. Please don't <laughs> sue us. <coughs> Nonetheless, we do test. <coughs> so investigation themes. Um, these, are, these are where we spend a lot of time and, and how we define these has changed dramatically even over the last two and a half years and it kind of depends on what you're trying to solve for. But you're trying to uh, <coughs> establish a, 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 an area of exploration without specifying the method, um, right? So, you know, how do we know if the train is late is an investigation theme, which involves a bunch of different sub-projects that became epic and tasks, right? So we can hear the train horn, we can see it when it goes by, we'll build things that do that. Um, we can use Caltrain's API and seek to understand where trains are on the line via that, and we can check Twitter, and then ultimately we will try and combine those uh, into a single uh, prediction about a train. And so that's sort of our, 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 um <coughs> our investigation theme. And if you follow me on Twitter and see some things like this, you can tell we're testing this system. It says, I, Caltrain, we're, we're, uh, we're on time as of 1848. Caltrain actually doesn't like you to tweet on time to their status. For some reason, they only want to hear from you if they're more than three minutes late, which sort of means that everybody's going to be negative, but whatever. I don't listen to them. <coughs> then we need to, 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 to execute, and we execute in the form of sprints, which if you're familiar with software engineering sprints, this is the same idea, right? A chunk of time, a couple weeks usually for us, uh, where we go after these kinds of questions, and it's, it's manageable, it's long enough to, to, to not sort of 
be checking in on people so fine-grained a way that, you know, it's like, yes, I'm looking at the same thing I was looking at yesterday, John. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Uh, there is a version of that, but, uh, but, but <coughs> sprints is sort of the chunk of time necessary to be able to present new results or outcomes from the work you're doing to your customers or uh, your internal customers. So <coughs> can we classify a passing local train, lo train into local or express was a hypothesis that we, we, we then incorporate into a sprint. Um, so that, that's sort of a sub-problem of the larger problem of, of can I operate a train, right? And <coughs> um, you know, in this case, on the audio side, we ended up experimenting with a bunch of things and settling on using fast Fourier transforms, which basically gives you uh, frequency domain information about uh, the sound of the train. And basically, uh, is everybody familiar with the Doppler effect when a train goes by? It's going really fast and it's a relatively, that was a great sound effect, hopefully. <laughs> um, so basically, we're, we're, we're measuring the, the fundamental frequency of the train as it goes by, and if there's a significant change in that, we think it's going fast, and therefore we call it an express. If there's a much lower difference, then we think it's a, a, a local. Um, <coughs> so that's a candidate approach. Um, we need to create the features, and then we have to decide what kind of model that we're going to use to do that. <coughs> so would have been nice if I used the same thing twice. And this is the, the, the video version of that, right? But a story is something like, I want to use image analysis to identify the direction of the train. Or I want to use F an FFT and a, and a model to understand uh, if it's a, um, a local or an express. And, and that would be a story. So that was uh, Tom, Tom Fawcett was working on that. Uh, there's actually a, a pretty interesting blog post about um, he was using hidden Markov modeling, a really nice, fancy advanced approach to, to trying to understand some of this and was sort of mildly disappointed and not surprised to decide that at the end of the day a simple decision tree was the best way to do that. So you go through a bunch of methods, sometimes you start with a really complicated one and end up using something that's uh, rather cheap and cheerful to solve the problem. It does not specify the method so much as uh, the class of methods or the class of problems and, and um, the goal of that, right? So <coughs> we have another source of train direction. So ultimately, you have a backlog of these things, right, that are adding up to completing your project, and there's lots of tools to do this. This is one we don't actually use anymore uh, called Sprintly. There's nothing wrong with it. We just <coughs> started using something else. Um, but, but um, you know, it, it allows you to manage both that, those primary construction tasks, plus you see one here that is, uh, I want to fix the frequency of images collected from the video camera. So if you notice when a car starts up, it wheel, the wheels look like they're turning forward, and then at a certain point they suddenly look like they're going backwards, and then they switch back. That's because of your natural frequency of your eye processing that input, and at a certain point you see the same thing, except it gives you the visual impression that it's, it's, it's this way, but what's really happened is it's gone around all that way, right? Same thing can happen with a passing train. If your frequency is wrong, you look at one passenger car and then your next sample is another passenger car that's like that. So you might think it's going that way when really it's just your frequency was showing you the next car coming this way, right? So all of these kinds of things can be managed by, hey, we need to put this in the backlog. We've noticed this problem. Let's go out and execute it. <coughs> Ultimately, we do these over a couple of weeks and we have what's called a retrospective. Um, the couple of weeks we do a stand up every morning that is basically uh, to keep people from getting stuck on their work, right? Hey, I can't get that data. Oh, Jim, do you have that data? Yes, okay, it's problem solved. Five minutes in the morning can save a week of frustration and, and that's the idea here. Um, it's about just saying, this is what I'm doing today, this is what I did yesterday and I'm not blocked in any way and if it goes very boringly all the time, that's great. It's not about trying to solve problems on the spot or have long conversations or things like that. And then ultimately we have a meeting where we demo, right? And that is um, a combination of saying, hey, this is what we did this time. Um, at the end of the two weeks, maybe we have results from a new model to show our client to say, hey, we're 85% accurate predicting local versus express. Uh, that's way better than it was a couple of weeks ago and, and we're making steady progress, but we're not done. John, in this case, I'm the product owner of this one, should I keep working or is that good enough or should we abandon it, right? It gives me the opportunity to say, hey, keep going, or eh, that's good enough, or eh, this is never gonna work. 
and, and uh, this is what keeps you from spending long times building systems that ultimately uh, do not fulfill their, their promise for the, the people who are hiring you or are asking you to do them. We show them the demo of the thing. In this case, it was, hey, now we can show you where the train is on the line. Um, we, we, we also talk about lessons learned. So some will formalize the demo. We'll, we'll separate the demo from the lessons learned part of this. We throw them all together and call it a retrospective. Your mileage may vary. But the idea here is to do a combination of showing progress, getting steerage from the people who you're hoping to help, uh, and talking about what you've learned in the process that might influence that future direction. And ultimately, if you do that, you can create a world where you can have really rapid, innovative solutions to problems, as we were talking about before, that are driven by data science. I've just spent a bit of time talking about the top two blocks there. Um, if you're doing that with platforms and APIs, that makes data a lot easier to marshal around and makes all these things a lot faster to do. If you can do it on the cloud, you don't have to wait for a server order. Uh, if you use DevOps, then often your deployment of the thing into production is a lot faster than it otherwise would be. And if you're using open source tools, you have the benefit of not having to negotiate a software license every time you want to try a new product. Put these all together and you have what we refer to as an experimental enterprise that allows uh, people who like to do fun things with data to do so very efficiently. And with that, I will stop blabbing and enjoy talking to you about <laughs> your questions. All right, John, thank you. Okay, we've got about five minutes before we need to move on. Questions for John? You think just coming up from there about his experiment? Yes. So I'm relatively new to Agile, and I'm trying to apply it to machine learning, and it's like a big mission of the place where I work to implement Agile. Um, I have a particularly hard time in kind of the research phase of trying to implement, especially fixed length sprints, just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. And so the, the problem is that um, research is one of those nonlinear progressing things, right? You're looking to an answer. You, search engines may or may not give you the, the, the first paper you wanted, you needed to read, et cetera, right? Um, it's really about managing expectations and getting a team and a, both you and you, the researcher, and the consumers of the research comfortable with the fact that we're going to check in in two weeks. I might just tell you I haven't found the answer yet, right? And as long as everybody understands that that's a likely outcome, uh, it goes quite fine. In my experience, people not used to doing this squirm like crazy on both sides until they get used to this, right? So um, data scientists never want to sign up for a deadline. And I say, basically, the deadline is an expectation that we then constantly manage every morning in a stand-up and every two weeks in a retrospective. We don't actually hold you. The, the sin is not missing the deadline. The sin is failing to communicate about your progress towards it and helping people understand what's going on. Uh, so all of those things are uh, things that, 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 that we have to be comfortable being vulnerable. We have to have good relationships with the people we're working with. And we have to have open communication. Those things are very th hard things to solve in humanity <laughs> in general, not just data science teams trying to implement Agile. But that's a big part of the key is, is, is doing that on a team uh, and, and getting that comfort with each other. I often tell people, like my pro the people who run the backlogs for me, put more in the backlog than you ever get through so nobody gets the silly idea that every, time, every two weeks we get through the entire backlog, right? That's, that's, that's a micro waterfall project. It's not agile. Uh, so it's, it's expectations management is the key to that and life, frankly. Thanks. Others? Um, yes, behind you on the row behind it. Thank you. I think this is really timely. I just came out of a three-day agile class and I um, built kind of productionalized uh, data science oriented systems and, and everybody's in participating except for the analytics team right now. <laughs> so I, I'm curious, um, to me it sound, it's pretty, looked pretty traditional water, um, agile here. Is there anything, any tweaks that you made to the more the standard agile process to work with, for, especially in the analytics world? So the, the main, the difficult parts to adapt are figuring out how to write stories for data science work, uh, the granularity of them, like, it, you know, we, we used to be like, I'm going to try, you know, a random forest to predict this based on these 
inputs, right, which is too specific. Um, and I'm going to predict this is too general. You know, so figuring out how to write stories that properly capture what you're trying to do and allow you to sort of go, okay, hypothesis validated or invalidated uh, is one part of it. And, and ultimately writing, defining the hypotheses that feed into those subtasks is also a, a harder part. So most of what I presented is familiar to software engineering. The, the, the definition of an analytical hypothesis is not something commonly done there and it sort of overrides this but isn't explicit in the artifacts I showed. Um, but it is in the charter, right? So we will have documents and decks where we say, you know, like that sprint plan is not what shows up in any specific thing, but they're, they're the discussion around that will sketch out sort of the hypotheses we think we need to go after and things like that. So it's not so much that there's things that are massively different, it's at the granular story level is different, and then it's adapting the things that, that happen on top of it that is, that is more where the difference lies. Let's take a, just one and then a question in the center and then we'll wrap up. Thanks. Um, it's kind of all along the lines of the last question. I, have you considered continuous flow or Kanban as an alternative to sprints? Um, yes. Um, so in, in, um, in an internal team, I think those, in other words, when you're not consulting to a client, I think those can work really well, and I've used those when I was not consulting to clients on internal projects. So, and Kanban, it's, you can really um, apply that here uh, to a lot of this as well. The reason that, that we do um, sprints is, as, a con as, as somebody working under contract to an organization that we may be more or less familiar with, we really, really, really need customer engagement. We need to make sure that they, you know, we, we get hired to build, solve really hard problems. And um, so we need people to understand that it's not like, okay, here's your money, here's your contract, go do that, we'll see you in six months. You'll have the awesome answer and everybody wins. W were that to be possible, I'm sure everybody would like that. But, um, but the reason we do sprints is mostly to make sure that we have these points of contact with our customers uh, and can actively manage their expectations, whereas in an internal team, yeah, some of you can be a little bit more loosey-goosey on, on that. Okay. This question right in the middle there. Thanks. That was an interesting talk. Um, Thank you. So I c completely agree that data science and um, software engineering have a lot to do with each other and that learning from each other and kind of merging a little bit is definitely the future. It's the future that I see. My question for you as a student of data science, how much do I really need to know? What should I be learning? And what kind of, of, of the software engineering world, like how much do I really need to dig into to be an effective data scientist? Great, great question. Um, so we are, we ex we have a group of people, some of whom self-identify as data scientists, some of whom self-identify as data engineers, and ultimately you have to like decide what you're going to put on a business card and a job posting to satisfy regulators and a bunch of stuff like that. That said, the first blog post I ever wrote was about lovable misfits who blur the distinction between those two, and that's because an, an understanding of the, there are two sides of the same coin, and an understanding of the other side of that coin makes you better at either one. Um, you're asking the question of to what degree is it, you know, is there a law, is there a diminishing return, that kind of thing. Um, and, and I would, I would say that, um, that your, your understanding of the technical, the technical implementation of an algorithm can be really, really important to understand its scaling characteristics. Um, so, un algorithm and discrete math and, and, and understanding algorithmic complexity and things like that is in some data science programs and maybe not others. Uh, but but uh, I'll tell a story about a, a company uh, that I had some friends at, Climate Corp, uh, who, who take weather data from the FDA, they build climate prediction models, and then they sell crop futures based on the predicted weather. We have the greatest climate scientists in the world, arguably. Monsanto paid a billion dollars for them, so they must have been up to something good. But they all worked on SAS, all caps 1A, the big data mining workbench from North Carolina. And they would come up with a model. And then they say to the engineers, hey, whew, scale that crap. <laughs> they might have used a different word. Um, 
and the engineers are like, oh, that thing doesn't parallelize, and I don't have, ha Java doesn't have half the libraries I need to run that, right? So, which is to say that you can, you can, you can build solutions uh, that, that, that don't work for technical reasons, not business reasons, due to a lack of an understanding of the engineering challenges of putting those into production. So the more you understand about um, how an algorithm is going to work at scale uh, and the engineering challenges around that, the more, uh, the more you can be sure that your, your actual solution can be implemented in a fruitful way. The other thing is that, that a lot of people hire data scientists uh, and, and, and you know, like maybe a, a PhD in statistics uh, a year or two out of school and hope that A, they're going to be able to understand the business problem, uh, then they'll be able to take their quantitative methods, apply it to the data, and give them some great insights that will change the nature of the business, except all that data is in this huge Oracle database and that person doesn't know SQL. And um, even if you do know SQL, understanding how to, to, how to get it out in a, in a useful way can be a challenge. Uh, which is to say, the more self-service you can be in terms of getting at data and, and affecting the transformations on that data that you need to do to actually do the analysis, the more capable you will be. So there's almost, um, it's, it, I would treat it as a question of preference, uh, because if you do find the engineering side interest, uh, the deeper you, you, you won't regret going deep in it. Um, and, and people will appreciate you for having done so. I've yet to see anybody oversteer in, in that direction. On the other hand, engineers who understand the kinds of modeling and, and what demands those place on an infrastructure and architecture are really, really valuable because they, you, know, you can have a two-way conversation. We fundamentally think this is a team sport, so you should, you should almost always be working with a team of people who are looking after several of these concerns, and the more common language you have, the more effective you will be. Uh, so hopefully that was a good non-answer into, as far as your curiosity will take you, you will, uh, you will, you will certainly uh, appreciate it, uh, but, but, but the world needs you to focus on certain things and get good at certain things. So um, you know, there's probably a stage where you stop at, at understanding uh, how to get data in and out of databases and work with it and that thing versus getting into how do you actually implement algorithms uh, you know, in Spark. I can use team sport. I can move on from there now. Right, John, thank you very much for. Thanks, uh, everybody. For